As First Lieutenant Martin James Monty hitchhiked his way to Naples during the last stretches of World War II, he knew there was no turning back. The 22-year-old officer was determined and eventually made his way to the Pomigliano airfield, lied to the officers in charge, and basically stole a Lockheed F-5E Lightning. He then flew into German-occupied Milan and joined the Nazis as a propagandist and writer. During the war, it was not unusual for Americans of European descent to turn against their native country, and Monty's extremist and isolationist upbringing probably convinced him it was the right thing to do. However, as the end of the war approached and Germany was losing, Monty had to make a fateful decision, whether to stay with the Nazis and risk being arrested, or continue to test the limits of his lying capabilities with the U.S. Army. Blossoming Youth Martin James Monty was born in 1921 in St. Louis, one of seven children of hard-working immigrants. His parents were born in America, but his father's family was from the Italian side of Switzerland, while his mother was of German blood. Monty was raised Catholic in an environment later described as fervently religious and with isolationist sentiments. In that regard, they actively opposed President Franklin D. Roosevelt's New Deal economic program. During the 1930s, the now six-foot-two-inch-tall young man became an enthusiastic anti-communist lad. He was also a fanatical follower of Charles Coughlin, a famous Catholic priest known as the Radio Priest, who had a weekly radio program with tens of millions of listeners. The priest was known for his anti-Semitism, as well as being anti-communist. Furthermore, Father Coughlin had such a bigoted pro-fascist and pro-Nazi agenda that the Vatican was forced to silence him at the request of the American Catholic hierarchy. In fact, the then Cardinal Eugenio Pacelli, who had become Pope Pius XII, cooperated to mitigate the situation. Shortly after the Pearl Harbor attack, Monty registered for the draft. He then visited his idol in Detroit, although the nature of the visit is unknown. However, it is safe to presume Coughlin encouraged his impressionable acolyte to support Germany instead of the dreaded Roosevelt government, which had forced him off the air. Monty first attempted to enlist with the Navy, where his four brothers would serve honorably. But in November of 1942, he became an aviation cadet in the U.S. Army Air Forces. After qualifying as a fighter pilot on the P-39 Aero Cobra and the P-38 Lightning, and being promoted to second lieutenant in the summer of 1944, he was sent to Karachi in India, now Pakistan. He then earned his rank as a first lieutenant with the 126th Replacement Depot. A few weeks before turning 23, Monty took a trip that would change the course of his life. On October 1st, 1944, he hitched a ride from India to Cairo, Egypt. The young man was wearing his American uniform and had no official travel orders, but took advantage of either the laxness or gullibility of the American military personnel he encountered. While in Cairo, he secured another passage to Tripoli in Libya, and then talked his way into a third plane bound for Naples, Italy. Eastern Naples was under Allied control by then, and Monty got to the USAAF's 82nd Fighter Group at the Foggia Airfield Complex. He then requested a transfer and combat assignment, but the commanding officer turned him down. However, the astute officer had a backup plan and headed straight to the Pomigliano Airfield north of Naples, where the 354th Air Service Squadron repaired and tested aircraft. On October 13th, Monty impersonated a fighter pilot from the 82nd and got himself a Lockheed F-5E Lightning, the photo reconnaissance version of the P-38. With the facade of carrying out a test flight, Monty changed course to Milan, which was still in the hands of the Axis powers. As Monty landed on a small grass airstrip, he was taken into custody by the Germans. True Colors Despite his insistent claims that he wanted to serve the Reich, Monty was given the same treatment as any ordinary prisoner of war and was sent to a camp after interrogating him. On the other hand, the lightning was received with delight and promptly stripped of its insignias and decorated with swastikas instead. The day after he arrived in Milan, an arrest order for Monty was issued through American channels and intercepted by the Germans, who were now convinced of his legitimate defection. In November, Monty was sent to Berlin, where he joined the SS Standarte Kurt Eggers propaganda unit. The Germans hoped Monty would be as appealing a radio propagandist as his fellow countryman, Howard Margraf. For anonymity, the Germans changed Monty's name to Martin Roberts. Unsatisfied with the idea, Martin used his mother's maiden name, believing he could be identified if he was captured or shot. He also inflated his rank and created a personality named Captain Martin Wiethaupt for dramatic purposes. The officer did radio broadcasts from 1944 to early 1945 and even came into contact with the infamous Mildred Gillars, the American defector known as Axis Sally. However, Gillars despised him the moment they made eye contact and went to her supervisor to give him an ultimatum, quote, That man is a spy or a traitor. Either he must go or I will. 
As she was turned down, she said, quote, Then I've made my last broadcast. Monty's material was broadcast to Germans and Americans in the European theater. His indoctrination as a child became evident as he voiced his firm opinion that the United States should be fighting alongside the Germans instead of allying with the Soviets, who he thought were, quote, the true enemy of world peace. Moreover, he assured his listeners that the war was an evil plot devised by the communists to enslave the entire world. However, as time went by, Monty proved to be an incompetent announcer, lacking ability and experience. He was dismissed after a few broadcasts, and Galars was consequently reassigned. In the aftermath, Monty was tasked with writing propaganda pamphlets handed out to American prisoners of war. Monty would officially join the Waffen-SS later on, where he was given the rank of SS Untersturmführer. This was a demotion, the equivalent of a second lieutenant. By April of 1945, Germany required every available man to fight on the battlefront, and Monty was sent to northern Italy. However, shortly after his arrival on May 10th, Germany had already lost the war. While still wearing his German uniform, Monty surrendered to the U.S. 5th Army in Milan and managed to convince the American military that he had gone absent without official leave and kidnapped the aircraft only because he planned to wage a one-man war against the Germans. He then claimed to have been shot down and to have received help from Italian partisans to escape with a Waffen-SS uniform. No treasonable intent. The American officers did not recognize Monty's deception at first, and he was charged with being AWOL and misappropriation of government property. He was then sentenced to 15 years of hard labor, but served only a few months before receiving a pardon from President Harry Truman. Monty then re-enlisted as a private with the Army Air Forces in 1946, and within two years, he had climbed to the rank of sergeant. In the meantime, evidence of his actual actions was uncovered. An Army criminal investigation officer responsible for Monty's case tipped off Washington Post columnist Drew Pearson, who broke the story in November of 1947. A major investigation was then opened. On January 26, 1948, the Army granted the then sergeant an honorable discharge at New York's Mitchell Field. However, he was seized by the FBI within minutes and charged with treason for propaganda activities performed under the pseudonym of Martin Vithaupt. Despite his superior intelligence and IQ of over 130, Monty showed signs of immaturity, obsessive-compulsive behavior, and paranoid tendencies, not to mention his inherent narcissism. Still, he was deemed fit to stand trial by a team of psychiatrists and psychologists, who concluded that he was not mentally ill. Monty was indicted for 21 overt acts of treason, with a minimum penalty of five years and a $10,000 fine, or a maximum sentence of death. Set to begin on January 17, 1949, Monty's trial took an unexpected turn. Even though witnesses were flown from across the Atlantic to testify against him, the defendant pleaded guilty on all charges. The New York Times reported that Monty took the stand and confessed in open court, answering all the questions, quote, calmly in the affirmative. As he assured the court that he had acted voluntarily, the judge claimed, quote, that's enough for me. The defense attorney engaged in a futile plea for leniency, appealing to a sense of compassion given Monty's extreme upbringing, where he was fanatically conditioned to perceive communism as America's principal enemy. However, as the prosecutor claimed, quote, this man did everything he could to commit treason. He left no stone unturned. Monty was given a sentence of 25 years in prison, plus a fine of $10,000, and was sent to the penitentiary in Leavenworth, Kansas. Two years later, he tried to appeal the verdict, arguing that he had not acted with treasonable intent. Furthermore, he insisted his attorneys had pressured him to plead guilty, but the court reaffirmed the sentence. Then, in 1958, he appealed for the second time, claiming that, quote, the court which pronounced the sentence which the defendant is now serving was without jurisdiction. Declined again, Monty continued to abide by the sentence imposed on him until paroled in 1960. After serving only 11 years out of the original 25, he returned to his native Missouri and lived in Fort Lauderdale, Florida for the rest of his life. Thank you for watching my video. Let us know your thoughts in the comments below, and don't hesitate to contact us if you have any suggestions for future stories. Also, hit the like button and subscribe to all our Dark Documentaries channels for more anecdotes about the world wars.